I'd like to I'd like to welcome you all this morning. I have to kneel down since uh, I'm before greatness in both places. Um, Char was saying that uh, this is actually the June Menzies fan club. That's yes. <laughs> so that that's kind of neat. I'd like to. Uh, introduce uh, Chartaves, first of all, who's going to interview Jim Menzies, who's the featured speaker in the UNBC speaker series today. And um, I first, can everybody hear me in the back? Um, you, might the have to, you might have to move forward. Um, <laughs> you may. We'll see how that goes. Um, I first met June when uh, I was about a year and a half ago, I guess. We were talking. And she had mentioned that she had worked with the Baker government to me and knew times before that particularly. And uh, I got interested in it, but what caught my attention was she said to me, have you ever read that book on Tommy Douglas in the library? And I said, no. She said, you should read it. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I should. And uh, I've had it in my hand twice. And unfortunately, I haven't got that far yet. No, it's not. Really, I have criticisms. I thought. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I might, might. <laughs> so, with that, I'd like to uh, turn the proceedings over to Char and June, and uh, we'll see how the interview goes. If you can't hear, if you signal me, we'll have to stop the proceedings and move everybody forward. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is great to see all your friendly faces here. First of, uh, off, I'm going to start bragging about my friend June. So, uh, first <coughs> slide there, Order of Canada. Um, I'm just going to read it out quickly. Born at Glen Ewan. I, I pronounced that correctly. That's right. Glen Ewan, Saskatchewan. She has held senior uh, appointments in such federal agencies as the Anti Inflation Board, the Canadian Advisory Council on Status of Women and is now, or was, in what year was that, 80? Can anyone see the year? Mm -hmm. 81. 81. Mm -hmm. uh, head of the National Farm Products Marketing Council. Chief Executive Officer. And CEO. Thank you. OK, next <laughs> slide. Here's uh, just a 10-minute internet search to put in S. June Menzies and uh, some of the books that she has contributed uh, to or uh, been quoted extensively in and the um, uh, McGill Law Journal there from 1975, The Uncounted Hours. So that's what your specialty as an economist really was, women's work. Well, uh, yes, the problems of women not being recognized in the society, ever. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, zipping along to the next slide. University of Saskatchewan, honorary uh, uh, doctorate um, in law, and um, a nice biography here too. Mrs. Menzies has chaired the Farm Products Marketing Council since 1975 and is also its chief executive officer. She was vice chairperson of the Anti-Inflation Board, the Canadian Advisory Council on Status of Women, uh, private sector uh, with economist uh, Merrill Menzies Group in Winnipeg, and. Uh, Meryl Menzies uh, worked in uh, Diefenbaker's uh, government uh, in the Prime Minister's office. Um, she has conducted research in voluntary capacity for women's and consumer organizations, social agencies, director of the Canadian Research Institute for the Advancement of Women, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Bachelor's degree in political science and economics and master's degree in economics and admitted to the Order of Canada in 1981. Uh, one more slide about June. Wow. There's, um, this was in the archives in, um, I think, University of Manitoba. It just said, S. June Menzies Bank of Microphones. <laughs> <laughs> so probably uh, uh, Canadian Farm Products Marketing Council, that looks like about the right era. And then there's June. That's probably later. Later? That's probably the 80s. University of Columbia. Oh, that could be. Oh, no, I'm talking about this one now. Oh, oh I see. Yeah. yeah. So that's probably uh, talking to farmers. No, I was, well, that's okay. That's okay. 
<laughs> and then June looking gorgeous, and then um, um, speaking inspirational messages delivered at Inter uh, International Women's Day event in Brandon. Okay, now we'll talk about someone almost as interesting as June. Next slide. <laughs> and uh, there is uh, Deacon Baker. So bottom right, he's you know far away from um, June's neighborhood in Saskatchewan. Um, Prime Minister with Kennedy, with the Queen. Uh, next slide, please. And there he gets his own stamp. So what we're going to do is early years social justice, Bill of Rights, Commonwealth, votes, to resources. But instead of starting at the beginning, we're going to start in the middle. Next slide, please. Atherton. 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 So this epitomizes um, Deepin Baker's life and work. So tell us about Atherton, June. Oh, um, this um, this happened in in uh, British Columbia, and uh, on the Canoe River. Was, there was a train wreck. A uh, number of people were killed and uh, many others injured. And um, when I saw that, I thought, you know, um, when did this happen? And it, that happened, I think, about 1951. And um, when I first joined the Army when I was 18, uh, the first thing that I did was go to uh, Regina, where we got a uh, few instructions. And then we were immediately sent to uh, Wainwright, Alberta. And why I'm mentioning that is because I was in the same kind of, of uh, train that was made up that had this accident that killed all of these people. And so, um, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the wrong spot. <laughs> and, and so uh, the uh, CPR, uh, they, they all blamed you know, one lower, one lower, one lower, until they got to uh, Atherton, who was a telegrapher and was reporting on the was reporting on the uh, on the the weather and moving trains and what can be done, and uh, it happened that uh, Mr. Diefenbaker was at a Commonwealth conference uh, at the time in London or somewhere, and uh, and this young man who was 22 years old who was being blamed for the crash and charged with, uh, with manslaughter, uh, came to uh, Mrs. Diefenbaker, who was very ill in the hospital and was on, she wasn't going to live very much longer. And uh, he said, I want, I want uh, Mr. Diefenbaker to represent me. And uh, so she sent a telegram to uh, Mr. Diefenbaker, and, and uh, he uh, he was able to get away, and he flew it as quickly as he could to to uh, Saskatoon to talk to Olive, uh, and and. Uh, and she said, "I have told, I have told him that you will, that you will represent him." And he did get away, and he did come down. And uh, and what happened was that the there were steel cars on the end, both front and back of the car, and uh, in the center there were just wooden uh, wooden cars. And when the when the crash came, the 
the center cars just just uh, collapsed like an accordion, and uh, and uh, Mr. Diefenbaker did did defend him. And one of the things, uh, anyway, he he did defend him, and he did uh, uh, he did get him off, and. Uh, it was the manner in which Mr. Diefenbaker went about preparing his case, and, uh, which was he would spend weeks on a case and, until he knew the law better than anybody else. And, and he, he was careful who he asked questions of and all the rest of it. But uh, uh, he did win that case. and. Uh, it, just there, uh, but I guess when I was when that's I, I was started out by saying that was the kind of a train that I was on, and we went. We had to sit uh, out off the. We would whenever another train came along, we'd have to sit and wait, and it was hours before we got to Wainwright. And then a train from Vancouver came in and at the same time, and but since they had come from a further distance, we had to stand and wait for our stores and everything before we could do anything. But it was the same type of, of train and they hadn't done anything about this even though they knew the consequences of accidents. Excellent. And so his defense of Atherton really sort of epitomizes uh, his, his work in his career for, for the underdog and being determined yes. and um, justice, wanting justice for all. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. Next slide. Now we're going to go to the early years. Uh, well, tell us about, uh, so Diefenbaker was born in Ontario, but they had a move. Yes, they, he was. Uh, uh, he was a teacher. He was uh, his father was a teacher, and the and uh, he had uh, he had double pneumonia or something like that. The doctor said you've got to get out of this area, and you've got to go to uh, to uh, uh, Saskatchewan, where the weather is drier, and and uh, and you have a much better chance of of living <laughs> if you move. And uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta at the time were still territories, not province. And um, so uh, anyway, they did move out there because he was a teacher. He got a job uh, out there. And uh, uh, my mother was a teacher. Uh, as well, and uh, she got a job out in in Saskatchewan. Uh, simply, she was <coughs> on her way out. Uh, she had just graduated from the teaching uh, teaching degree, and uh, so she ended up there too. And my father was there. And <laughs> anyway, they ended up in the same boarding house in Lenewen. And the uh, person in charge of the house said, I want to warn you, if High Green approaches you, uh, don't, don't answer anything he says. And so, <laughs> so uh, anyway. Uh, Maybe we can go to the next slide so we get a map. The next one? Well, they, the, uh, well it's, it's just that, uh, 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 Diefenbaker's family had come out, and they were a very, um, a very well-read uh, family. Several doctors and lawyers and uh, within their family, and, and uh, there wasn't anything that Deep hadn't read when he was young uh, regarding the classics, etc. And so, um, but my my parents were uh, were. In the same situation, had a job because of a teacher, and uh, about. Uh, 
they, they were very young and they were very uh, totally different. Um, and so this is, this is sort of your neighborhood with uh, um, Glen Ewan yes. and Wacow and yeah. north of Saskatoon, Prince Albert area. Shark, can I say one more thing? Sure, of course. The, the, um, oh yes, it's, it's when my, uh, my father uh, did speak to mother and mother said she wasn't going to okay. tell him what, his, what her name was. And uh, he said, well, that's okay. You look like a bill to me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then, well, I was saying ever after, that's the name that she, right from childhood till old age, she was called Bill. <laughs> yeah, they called, called her Grandma Bill. Yeah, they, yeah. they called her Grandma Bill. And, and uh, but, uh, they did speak to each other, and they did, <laughs> before too long, they got married by a justice of the peace, and they headed, headed out to uh, Athens, Ontario, where, uh, where the first child was born. And, uh, and Don, coming back, they had to come back on a harvest train that trains went back Fourth during harvest, and dad uh, and, and uh, mother had had the baby in just kind of a handbag, um, and everybody was surprised to see what it was. And here she had this little baby, and, uh, and that was the first time that uh, mother got back out to Ontario for about 16 years. And Mr. Diefenbaker had exactly the same experiences. And um, Diefenbaker's mom brought from Ontario to um, rural Saskatchewan an, an upright organ, and your oh, mom that's right. brought... My mother had an upright piano. Okay, so these are <laughs> valuable things you need to drag around uh, with they you. They had an organ, <laughs> and, and we families were together in those days. You didn't have somebody running off and doing one thing. And you had to be together all the time as a family. And we, and we sang and we entertained ourselves and we used the schoolhouse for concerts. And being a small community, there was a, a friendliness that uh, in families that well, I hear, I hear reports today they're trying to get back to some of these things that we used to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide, Dave. So here's young Dee, uh, and um, there was many more pictures in it. They always say, uh, say Dee Finn Baker with cousins. So yeah, very close to Oh yes, yeah, so they're, they're doctors and lawyers and everything like that. He grew up in the province and was interested in politics from a young age, and we have a quote from Diefenbaker when he's 13. Yes, uh, Mr. Diefenbaker uh, was always interested. Uh, he had a very curious nature and he was always interested in what was going on. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, he went to, he went to meetings. The Farmers Institute? Uh, the Farmers Institute and grain growers and this kind of thing. And, and uh, right after school, instead of going home, he'd run and he'd listen to what was going on. And when he was, I think, about 13, uh, he was a very shy person. And he uh, was listening to the what was being said about about the homesteaders and about how uh, uh, how they were being cheated by the what he called them the the lords I think he called them the lords of the grain trade living in luxury in Saskatoon while these uh, poor farmers could hardly make a living mm -hmm. and were always being cheated on the grade of their grain and the uh, they, uh, they could appeal, but then they would have to take the grain back again, and then they never got 
there was never an appeal heard. And uh, so uh, he stood up. He said he didn't know where he got the courage from, but he said, this thing is wrong. Someday I'm going to do, to change that, I'm going to do something about it. And uh, everybody clapped and they just thought it was great. And uh, it was sent to the magazines as one of the best jokes of the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the uh, young speaker who had made up his mind and he, that's when he decided he was going to be a lawyer. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Here's the uh, World War One, and uh, June, <coughs> you told me a story about he got injured when he was digging in the tunnels? Yes. Um, what happened, uh, initially they would only take senior officers. Uh, but then they ran out of senior officers. <laughs> <laughs> and so they took, uh, and so when Mr. Diefenbaker heard that, uh, that they were the more junior ranks could go, um, he, could, he and, and immediately went to two friends and they all wanted to go there. The, and so he, he, um, <coughs> they signed up? Yeah, they, they, they went and they signed up. And this has got to be the second World War. No, he was in the first. That was in the first. trenches. Okay, well, um, uh, one day, uh, he was very, very athletic, did, did everything. And he, he was digging in the trenches underground uh, to, and uh, some, and they didn't, whoever it was, didn't know that anybody was down there. And he threw down this, this uh, kind of, uh, I forget what the name of it is, but it's, it both bored and chopped. Mm -hmm. Like and, heavy machinery. Yeah, and it, uh, it dropped right on Diefenbaker's spine. And, uh, mm -hmm. So he was permanently crippled after that, and he wanted to, his friends wanted him to report his condition, but he said no. He was too anxious. He didn't want to miss the excitement of what was going on, and so he took a few days sick leave, and then he went uh, overseas. But uh, his two friends both were killed. And, and he was left a cripple. Next slide, please. <coughs> so here's young Deep as, as a lawyer, and he, he decided early on he could not be a prosecutor. Yes, he, uh, because he studied the law, and he studied, he studied history and, and uh, uh, he had, he had he was just interested in all subjects, uh, including the law. But what he realized uh, when he was uh, starting to defend somebody, that he was so uh, intent on the case that if he were acting as a prosecutor, he would convict innocent people <laughs> and it would have to be challenged. And so he thought, he said right there, that I am not going to be a prosecutor. I'm going to be a defense lawyer. And uh, that's what he did for the rest of his life. He, he was an uh, extremely good defense lawyer. Next slide, please. So here we have uh, members of the Progressive Conservative Party after Deepen Baker was nominated in, in 1929 <coughs> in front of the Prince Albert Public Library. So Prince Albert is where your, your families intermingle, again, Deepen Baker's family and your yes. family. Well, what happened, uh, what happened, of course, was the Depression. <laughs> and nobody in Saskatchewan was unaffected by the Depression. Either you had to go east or you you had to go 
north or south. <laughs> you, and, and so, um, uh, well, it was, uh, I could use as an example the Palace of Triangle, which used to be a very rich area. And, um, but it completely dried up, and the dust blew, and the gravel blew, and, and so, uh, and that, it would be about 1929 that we left. And by this time, my parents had six children, <laughs> which, which uh, and they came in rapid succession until the doctor said to my dad, you know, um, you must not continue like this or, or you're, you'll be left looking after six children. And so, oh, hi. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and, and, um, so, and where did you move? We moved, we moved to, uh, uh, well, we moved to Prince Albert and, and uh, North Battleford and, and that area. And uh, Mr. Diefenbaker, by this time, was all, also in Prince Albert. And um, he told by, he, he uh, asked my dad if he could take, uh, uh, if he could help uh, mm. take Glenn, mm. pay Glenn's way at university. Because Glenn, wanted, my second brother, wanted to be a doctor. and. Um, Dad said, thanks, Steve, I can look after my own family. And uh, so Mr. Diefenbaker said, well, I advise you to move to Saskatoon because they had, uh, they had uh, good high schools and good university, and uh, it was the, the best way to get an education. So that's when we uh, moved to Saskatoon, and uh, well, it was just a wonderful city. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. So here we have young uh, Diefenbaker, um, 1926, going after William Lyon Mackenzie King against him because the sitting Liberal gave up his seat because King had lost his seat. Yes. Um, King won easily. <laughs> so, um, um, Mr. Diefen young Diefenbaker here was very, very feisty and determined. Yes, he, uh, that, uh, he, he was in, I think, for about uh, three years, unless I'm thinking of him. Well, he, he, he ran when. He ran for decades and only got in. in the yes. Uh, yeah. But, uh, I think. Yeah, we'll, I'll have to. I'll have to skip that. Yeah, we'll come back to that because we're going to talk about Conrad Black next. next. Conrad Black. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> his quote. Oh, his quote. <laughs> oh, pop quiz. <laughs> so, uh, civil rights. Even oh, this, this, for civil this, rights. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, Conrad Black just said the worst things, and he was doing a history of a history of Canada from the very beginning, and uh, he says John Diefenbaker was not a successful prime minister, but uh, he was very for formidable, a, a deadly, a deadly campaigner an idiosyncratic but galvanizing public speaker, a brilliant pub parliamentarian, uh, and he had many fine qualities. He was absolutely honest financially, a passionate supporter of the average man and the underprivileged and disadvantaged person, a fierce opponent of any racial or religious or socioeconomic discrimination, and while much and while much criticized, few could disagree with with him about anything. <laughs> he 
said, excepting politicians, etc. Um, he was the first leader of Canada since Champlain, a third of a millennium before, who seriously respected and cared for the native peoples. And that, that comes from, it's almost believable, but that came from, from black. <laughs> All right, next slide. <coughs> okay. Hmm. The interviewer is confused. <laughs> okay, oh yes, yeah, so here we go. So he's, he's uh, elected in 1945 and 1949. Um, next slide, please. Um, June, this is um, one of many pictures of Diefen Baker where he's wearing um, oh, the yes. headdress. Yeah. Um, is that, can they see it? Yeah. The picture? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, you, said you were saying he was an honorary chief? Yes, he was named uh, uh, in Saskatchewan and Alberta, um, was named as an honorary uh, chief with all their parades and feathers and everything, and uh, in about five or six communities, and uh, and he was very proud of that, having received. Well, he always said he was humble and proud, but it was a great recognition of his demand for equality and and rights for the native people, etc. Next slide, thanks. Bill of Rights, and we've got a quote in there too. Yeah, um, well, I think what it was this section uh, here? Okay, uh, I've left it to the last, our program of social justice. This was an essential part of my vision. To me, government not only, be, not only had to be of and by the people, but most positively for the people. Unless government concerned itself with the problems of the individual working man and farmer, Unless the government was cognizant of the problems of small businessmen and not just of the corporate giants, unless government acted in the interests of our senior citizens, our veterans, our blind and disabled, unless government sought a basic equality of citizenship, of opportunity, and of well-being, for all our peoples, then government had lost sight of its true purpose, the human betterment is the essence of government. Excellent. Pretty powerful words. Next slide. So he appointed uh, the first ever First Nations person to the Senate and the first ever woman to a cabinet. And you knew a little bit about Ellen Farquhar. Yes, she was an accountant uh, and uh, had, uh, uh, well, uh, when Ethan Baker appointed her, he also mentioned that she'd be very good looking. <laughs> the kind of thing that you'd never say about a man. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unless. You take for, for, for you take for for granted mm. that uh, a man had all the qualities that were necessary, uh, but uh, and, uh, she was uh, she was an extremely good and and loyal and if anything if if she could do anything she did it and she went out of her way to help anybody. She was also a very generous person. Excellent. Next slide. 
Oh yes, um, his uh, he introduced the Bill of Rights in 1958, but it didn't come through until 1960 um, because what the Liberals were. Well, yes, <coughs> the. Uh, uh, The book, the, the Bill of Rights, uh, there's a list of the things that they demanded. He, he set out everything that was demanded to give people equality and to make us one nation. Uh, I think we've been kind of had this before, um, I, but it was... Uh, um, uh, you were just telling me that the liberals were doing everything they could do to stall it, to stonewall it, to oh yes, to because make it they, go away. they didn't, they didn't believe in it. They felt that uh, I guess that uh, his his point there was that uh, anybody, like people with money, could defend themselves, but. To establish a real nation, you had to have equality within all parts of the country. It could be so. That's why he went to the Maritimes, and he was doing things there when it, uh, when he was developing power, etc., things like that, and they and. Uh, and taking away from the from the farmers, it was just uh, yeah. it, again. It's it's his attitude of one Canada, uh, one nation, and support every part of the every part of the nation to keep them together and to make sure that uh, you don't have interference from another country, like. The United States mm -hmm. who expected to take over Canada from uh, right to the tip of the Arctic. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> I'm not being very articulate. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, we're getting it. So here's a picture of uh, Deacon Baker talking with a farmer. Wheat sales to China and agricultural reform revitalized Western agriculture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, he'd been on a he'd been on on a trip. Uh, the, initially, the Commonwealth was you know the uh, Canada Australia uh, about five or six countries, and and uh, what was your question? Um, you had told me a story about um, the uh, 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 plate that was decorated with a beautiful sheet oh, of wheat. Oh yes, he was on a trip. Uh, he was uh, in China, and, and he wanted to uh, he wanted to extend uh, Canada's trade with various nations, and uh, when he was in China. They were the uh, Ikeda, who was the uh, prime minister, kept looking at the plate that uh, he was eating from, and uh, he asked. Uh, it was it was a, a sheaf of wheat, and every plate had this beautiful sheaf sheaf of wheat uh, shown on it. And um, and so uh, the prime minister turned the plate over, and he saw that it was made in China. <laughs> <laughs> and and because it was made in China, immediately he said, uh, "You know, I'm going to open the markets." And he he uh, opened uh, opened the markets. To, uh, to Canadian wheat, and, and this was around the time that they were building, and, and Diefenbaker also wanted to establish um, food programs and have uh, 
the place where if there wasn't if there was a a a drought or uh, people couldn't eat in one place this food would these grain would be there to help them in their search for a life that, uh, well, we see now about what's happening to the refugees, and it was much like that. Next. Social justice. Under the philosophical umbrella of social justice, the Diefenbaker government restructured programs to provide aid to those in need, just oh, as you okay. were saying. Yeah. In addition to the Agricultural Rehabilitation and Development Act, his government also established a Royal Commission on Health Services, as well as the National Productivity Council, later named the Economic Council of Canada. Okay, next slide. Um, here we've got some pictures from his Commonwealth uh, tour, and oh yes, well that was that was when uh, we took that Commonwealth uh, tour. And uh, they were adding other countries had uh, uh, been receiving uh, aid from from Canada, and uh, and he wanted he wanted them to know these are countries that he wanted them to know that this aid came because they were members of the Commonwealth, and they were accepted into the Commonwealth without discrimination. And, uh, well, there's, uh, there's not much to say uh, that I haven't said about that, excepting that it was, it was his recognition that you needed control of your own resources, mm -hmm. and you need others to open their doors. And this trip took him to many countries, and uh, and he realized that, uh, in spite of the problems of the United Nations and the fact that some things weren't working right, he wanted everybody to know who was receiving our aid that. It came from Canada because they were a member of the Commonwealth, not because, you know, and, uh, well, it was just the continuation of his lifelong expectation. I'll give you an example. Uh, It, uh, in the uh, the Americans, when when they invested in Canada, their companies and he knew about this because he was a student that um, they held control of their own resources of our resources yeah of 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 their of our resources and they didn't acknowledge that it had come from somebody else and they at and if under these circumstances it's the owner that keeps control and uh, and doesn't uh, and doesn't have to share and uh, so this was when he took uh, he had uh, initially great troubles with the United States because of of the control not being in in uh, at all being in the hands of the, where the resources came from and uh, so the Americans the American individuals owned a lot of Canada's resources and there was a real fear at that time that they would just basically take over yeah, it wasn't individuals though or large companies, companies American yeah. companies sorry yeah. And so the Commonwealth, strengthening the Commonwealth was to also counterbalance this huge yes. power of the, the U.S. Yes. Excellent. Next slide, Dave. And this is um, um, more of his Commonwealth tour. Uh, next slide. And he's uh, involved in the early days when it was still called the Empire. 
Parliamentary Association. Yeah, I've been over that. Uh, next slide. So there's Ceylon, India, uh, Malaya, Singapore, Australia. <coughs> um, what do we got next, Dave? Got picture again. And next slide. More empire meetings. Okay. Next slide. We're going to talk roads to resources. Oh, okay. <coughs> so tell us, um, June, about Merrill's PhD thesis. Yeah. Uh, well, <coughs> what happened there <coughs> was that um, Merrill had developed a his PhD thesis, well, he was with the World Bank and with other countries, and, and um, he was studying. In fact, I was with him because by this time we had a baby, and uh, he was going to be away for a couple of years developing this thesis. And it's in London. In London. Yeah. Yeah, the London School of Economics. And uh, so we. We, um, when he when he had finished it, it was it was just a, a brilliant study regarding the development of Canada's resources in the north because there were so many uh, so much to be done there, and um, so when we finished it, uh, I had a brother who was a was a uh, doctor. And Prince Albert, and he was a great friend of Ethan Baker's, and uh, and, uh, and oh yes, and, and he had called this study uh, "Road to Resources," and and uh, so uh, oh yes, I said uh, that Ethan Baker, uh, there was a, a campaign coming up, and he wanted to. He, the great difference between his uh, course and the others is he wanted these resources developed. And um, uh, when he had first started, they, they uh, opposition called it TP to TP. <laughs> and then when he uh, wanted to, his Developing the war, the north, it was called igloo to igloo. <laughs> but so um, that was also part of the the push. Oh, it was the dash. Okay, and so when uh, Diefenbaker at first, when first when he read this paper, he thought that's interesting, but it's just not. It, it's just not realistic. And then when he was on his way back to Ottawa after having. Uh, read this paper, as he was reading the paper, he thought that is the core of the campaign that's coming up. And, uh, and, and uh, oh yes, and he, and he got, he uh, asked uh, my husband, Beryl, to join his campaign. And uh, as Ethan Baker said, he always did his own his own uh, uh, analysis. He always wrote his own speeches, but after talking to everybody and getting everybody's advice, that he could put everything together and come up with what he wanted to say. And uh, uh, when he. When he, when he introduced uh, Merrill's paper, Merrill joined his campaign train, and, uh, and Merrill had called this Roads to Resources, and so Ethan Baker just, it was just as though he had named this himself because Merrill was on his team, and so he was entitled to use this work. And one of the things that uh, amused me about it was when, uh, when the uh, uh, Kennedy started about uh, roads to resources. 
uh, uh, he could hardly believe that uh, Canada had roads to resources too. <laughs> okay, next slide, Dave. Um, so there's quite a few uh, photos with Stephen Baker opening, opening uh, grand opening of, of various um, resources and industry in the north. And uh, here he, he is um, at the Canada Alaska microwave system opening in uh, the Yukon, and he's actually on the phone with President Kennedy. And uh, Kennedy and Stephen Baker did not get along. No, not at all. <laughs> because um, Kennedy was uh, totally ignorant of, of uh, Canada. And, uh, well, one of the things that he did, for example, was to make his brother Attorney General. And uh, Mr. D. Baker uh, asked him, you know, how could uh, he make his brother Attorney General? And so, uh, he, he's not even a lawyer. And uh, Kennedy said, do you know a faster way? <laughs> <laughs> do you know a faster way to become, you know? Word. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, he, and uh, uh, what was his brother's name? Anyway, he, he, ha he had about uh, nine children. Or, or something of that nature, and uh, was not interested in, in politics. It was a different kind of life. But, uh, uh, and um, the and and, Diefen, and, and uh, no and, and um, whenever Diefen Baker uh, said, "This is what we did." Well, he was talking about the about the song and the and the, and the. Uh, Devastation, and uh, and uh, Kennedy had no knowledge of anything. Of uh, as he said, Eisenhower, uh, who had uh, was there, uh, had been there, was saying that that um, he was very cooperative and listened very carefully and thank thank. Uh, Deep for what was what was being developed, and, um, and and Kennedy just regarded the presidency as a plum. It's just something that had come to him, and uh, he didn't, he didn't credit the knowledge or the existence of, of, Can of Canada as a nation, and. Uh, Yeah, good. Oh, yes, yeah, so and at the, at the other thing that Deacon Baker wanted, because, because the uh, atomic bomb was being developed in, in various places, and Deacon Baker's whole, right from the beginning, he wanted it controlled and, and, uh, well, it was, as you know, we were back in, into another war. And um, I can't say much about that, excepting that, his, uh, that uh, he didn't want our children not to have a future. And... Uh, Anti-nuclear. Yeah. Next slide, Dave. He, here he is speaking at the opening of uh, Inuvik, 1961. And next slide. Uh, John D. Baker opening construction of the South Saskatchewan River Dam project. That took a long time to get that. Oh, it, 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 that had been that had been one of the uh, oh, back to about. Well, certainly, uh, back to about the 18th or sometimes 17th century. 
it was a long time coming, so we had to wait for Adif to grow up and finally get to be Prime Minister, and now he's pushing the button and making it, so. Next slide. <coughs> and that's the man from Prince Albert. <laughs> oh, well. <coughs> that's the last slide, June. <laughs> Yes, I do. <laughs> and <laughs> and, and uh, uh, his own cabinet wasn't supporting him. They, uh, there was a lot of controversy about it, but he did lose the, he did lose the, the, uh, you tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it was supposed to be one of the most advanced jet uh, fighter planes in oh, the world at right. the time, yeah. yet for some reason well, further development was cancelled. Yeah, it was cancelled because um, because uh, they couldn't, they wouldn't have control of it because it was there was controversy and he and there was. Right within his own cabinet, he was being uh, he was being undermined. So it wasn't pressure from the United States, or well, uh, it was pressure from Canada too. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so you were saying that. Um, he was going from, uh, I'm not sure if it was Prince Albert or Saskatoon back to Ottawa, etc. When they traveled back and forth, was it planes, trains? How did they do all that back and forth stuff in those days? Oh, well, that uh, back and forth uh, at the time, they didn't have, um, they paid for a lot of it by themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why there were so many court cases about it same thing that's going on today. Mm -hmm. But did the, so did the members of Parliament when they were left Ottawa? Did they were they used did they used to travel by rail home, or did they were did they travel by plane? Well, it did. Uh, when um, well, there was a, there was in the early days. <laughs> <laughs> they traveled by rail, and then when they could tra could travel by plane, uh, they uh, a lot of them had to pay their own expenses. It depended on what you were doing, and and there was so much um, use of of uh, uh, aircraft uh, for the wrong reasons that uh, there was simply it was simply. Uh, no longer manageable. And then you said that Beryl joined the the uh, the train, the election train. So did they election by? Did they do electioneering by a train? Campaigning by train. Campaigning. Yes. Oh, oh yes. Mm -hmm. um, he used the train, um, and he used and uh, and. Uh, and he also used uh, uh, helicopters and dropped down various places, and uh, it was called Main Streeting, is what they called it. And um, that was when, when um, he began talking to the people, and, and there was uh, uh, great support uh, for. Uh, he dropped down and. Uh, Visit the farmers, or or visit the community, and uh, had arrangements made ahead of time so that people would know when he was going to be at a certain place, and uh, it was uh, uh, he carried that on, and found that that was the way that people uh, got to know him, and they would talk to others, and uh, they loved 
him, he, they love the person-to-person -person contact, and mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, and they began to think that they played a part in the election, and uh, so that was uh, so he he did carry that on, and then he, as the uh, equipment developed, he he would change, but always always to talk to people in person. Last question. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, what would you say about Ethan Baker was quite ahead of his time? Was he what? Quite ahead of his time. Ahead of his time. Oh, uh, yes, he was. Inequality in human rights, in recognizing everything that had to be done, like the control of atomic energy, the, 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 you know, just, you know, you had to, you had to be master in your own house and uh, in order to develop the nation from. Okay, Jim, yeah. we'd really like to thank you for coming this afternoon. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> but it really is a pleasure because it, we never get to actually hear from people who were there. Yeah. And I think putting putting a whole different aura around the era makes it come alive. And I'd yeah. really like to thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank all of you too. Down at my